Holly Mazza in conversation with director Rachel O'Riordan. Holly is sat on a chair to the right, facing Rachel on the left. They are both sat on a stage with the auditorium behind them, with three tiers of seating. Holly is a 30-year-old white woman with median length dark brown hair. She is wearing round glasses, a black jumpsuit, bright blue socks with bees on them and black ankle boots. Rachel is a white woman with blonde hair, wearing jeans and a green shirt. Rachel's pronouns are she, her. Hi, I'm Holly Mazza, the Head of Drama at Fulham Boys School and I'm joined by Rachel O'Riordan, the director of A Doll's House and the artistic director of the lyric Hammersmith, where this production was first produced in 2019. Hi Rachel. Hi. Um, it's lovely to speak to you today. My first question is about Niru's journey as, um, as a character throughout the play. It's a completely transformative journey that she goes on. And I wondered how you worked with the actress, Ajana Vasan to develop that journey and demonstrate it through her use of performance skills. One of the first jobs we did was to consider how a upper middle class Bengali woman in Victorian India would move. Um, obviously the movements are particular to character, but they're also particular to time and place. So um, that is, the first thing that informs that is her social status, which in the case of Nero is quite high. Um, the second thing that really informs that is cultural mores. So what is acceptable for women um, and how they sit was a big thing for us. Um, in uh, Nero's culture, um, sitting on the floor is more common, sitting in chairs, but we did. Um, so that was partly what informed the set design, which I'm sure we'll come to later. But we, we spoke about her physicality in the sense that a woman of her social standing and class would have had um, dancing lessons, for example, from, from childhood. So she'd be very mobile and quite expressive, but also quite contained. Um, and elegant was a word that I think we would have used in rehearsals, that she was an elegant person. Um, she would also, her movements would also be informed by her clothing and the specificity of the sari and how that was worn was something that we'd spent a lot of time working on, of course. Um, and so those three things would inform how she moves. And then added to that, that's the things that are, if you like, the, the mise-en-scene of the character. And then on top of that is the interpretation of the character. So actually you would see that by the end of the play, Anjana's movements as Niru had changed. So she became more expansive, she became more expressive, she became more direct in her physicality and her voice. So the last scene in which she leaves Tom, there's a particular moment when she says, that to think I had children with you, I could tear myself to pieces. And she moves into a very aggressive physicality onto herself, but also towards him. And that was a completely, that was a journey towards that that we went on. It felt like there was a real strength to Nero's character that, I identified with as a woman watching in 2021 and it felt like she was always trying to mask that when she was around other characters, particularly through her use of voice. Her voice changed very specifically when she was trying to cover that up. I wonder how you developed that with Angina to kind of know when to bring that out and when to hide it. That's a great question. We did. We absolutely talked about that and there's um, the very opening of the production where Anjana comes in and she's been, Niru has been out to the market and has naughtily bought her jalebis that she's not allowed to buy. And Tom, her husband, is off stage. And his voice, we decided, it's very powerful. It fills the space even though he's not there. And Anjana uses a particular tone and she uses it around him. And she uses it for an effect and she, to get things out of him that she wants. Her actual, the character's actual voice wasn't that. This was a deliberate um, game she plays with Tom. The voice and the body can't be separated actually in performance, they have to work in tandem. So in that opening scene, she plays with her physical relationship with him as well. Um, and but vocally, yeah, absolutely. So she has her own register of voice like we all do. And then she has a kind of, the character has a, has a, a performing voice, which is really largely for Tom 
I can't recall that she uses it. She doesn't use it with Dr. Rankin. She certainly doesn't use it with Mrs. Lahiri and she doesn't use it with Umadi. Um, or she certainly doesn't use it with Das. Um, it is just for her husband. So throughout the play, it's really clear that Tom's vocal and physical dominance um, can sort of be felt by Nauru and the other characters. Yeah. But there's always a fragility behind his kind of dominance and you feel like it's always on a knife edge. How did you explore that with the actor Elliot Cowan through his performance? The character of Tom Helmer on the, on the surface has got all the power. He's white, he's male. He is in colonial India, so he has got, in terms of status, he is very much on, on paper, much higher than Nehru. However, inside of the character of Tom Helmer um, is a profound fragility, and um, as you say, which in our interpretation is based on many things. We, we did a lot of work on his backstory, on, on who he was, where he went to school, um, what his relationship with his father was like. Um, and it's important to remember that not all of the people that went to, the white people, white men that went to India, in, in colonial India, were necessarily hugely wealthy and, um, as we would call it now, posh. To some, sometimes, these people were people who, if, if they had stayed in England, would not have been working in particularly high-level jobs. They'd be educated, yes, for sure. Somebody like Tom, as a kind of middle-class person, would have... Um, occupied a role in India very different to the role he would have occupied at home. So his role is elevated by the simple act of his presence in colonised India. So you have a really interesting intersection of, of gender, because he's a man, race, because he's white, and politics, because he's actually in a country that doesn't belong to him. So within that, he takes power. But even as I say this, it doesn't feel like it's real, does it? because it's, it's all invented. Inside him, he knows that. And so there's a profound fear inside him because this isn't his country. He doesn't belong here. And his status is fake. And so that fragility and that instability within him is something we really did explore and talk about. And of course, his profound fear is what's realised in the plays that, his, that Nero leaves him. And as the play goes on, he starts to sort of get a sense of losing that power mm. and control. Did you work with uh, Elliot on how that would affect the way he stood or the way he sat or the yeah. way he spoke? There's a moment at the beginning where he scoops her up, literally picks her off the floor. Um, and she doesn't, uh, you know, she's not ready. She's the, 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 he kind of scoops her and just plops her down on his knee like a child. And there was, I, I remember, I never tired of watching that moment because in Anjana's response to it, there was such complexity. There was anger, there was, there was resistance, and then there was working into the moment. We did some work on Eliot's um, vocal qualities, um, not so much around accent, which we did for Nehru, because the characters are specified by Tanika Gupta in her script, speak with Bengali accents. Um, we did some work on, I suppose, an, a sort of more bombastic tone for Tom than he than Elliot naturally speaks with. So it was more about quality than accent with him, with his work. And what is real is the world that Nehru lives in prior to Tom existing in her life. Yeah. And so what feels more believable in terms of uh, her experiences is her relationship with Miss Lahiri, Miss Lahiri yes. and um, the kind of back and forth between those two characters, particularly in terms of social status. Yeah. Um, how did you explore that with those two actors? What's interesting about the relationship with Nehru and Mrs Lahiri, and again, you know, I find it, the, the detail of Tanika's script where she is Mrs Lahiri um, in the character um, breakdown, and we use that formal tone with her because she's a widow. Um, so she's widowed and she is really um, desperate financially desperate, she's destitute. So what she, what's so fascinating about that, she has to hold on, she tries to hold on to her dignity whilst being destitute. Um, her and Nehru started out pretty much in the same class, if you like, in the caste system of India, they would have been in the same category. But whilst Nehru has held 
her ground and possibly in colonial India had her status enhanced by her marriage to a white man, Mrs. Lahiri's status has plummeted. She's poor and she's widowed. She has no children. So she, in that environment, is in real desperate straits. So she comes to Nehru with, with, to lean into their old friendship, their childhood friendship, and to ask for help. And also we worked out in rehearsals because she sort of thinks that Das might be around. Um, and she's heard that, she, that he might be in Kolkata. Kolkata. Um, and he is. But she's playing her last card. But she thinks that Nero has everything, that Nero is in a really safe, safe place, literally and metaphorically in a really safe place. And she isn't because she doesn't know what Nero is dealing with, this enormous debt that she's, you know, and this, the blackmail situation she's dealing with. She just, she's got no idea that's going on. So it's a kind of an interesting thing, too, isn't it? We don't, I mean, we, we don't know what people are dealing with day to day. On the surface, Nero has it all. And Mrs. Lahiri is jealous. Um, but really, when she finds out what Nero is really living with, what I love about Tanika's version of this play is that the female solidarity that kicks in, um, because when Mrs. Lahiri realizes that Nehru is not as sort of comfortable as she thinks, she swings into action and she tries to help her. And how uh, does that impact on the way that the two actors use the space in the performance? So um, because we had a static set, the relationship, the physical relationship between the characters actually became really exposed, which I loved. So you could, for example, we had on stage left here, we had a ramp and in our mind that became on occasion the kitchen. For example, there's a scene where they're having their lunch and they just sit and we just lit it so that it felt like they were in the kitchen. So in that sense, it wasn't naturalism. Um, we used the actors' bodies to make the scene. We used the set as as we wished to make a scene. The way we just placed the actors and said, "Now you're in the kitchen. Now you're in the." We had that beautiful veranda around the top, and that that was deliberate. I'm just going to draw attention to how beautiful this theatre is. This was the, the veranda around the top was designed to mirror that the dress circle, so that the um, audience in the circle felt that they were meeting the actors' eyes, mm -hmm. because sometimes in a theatre like this, there can be the stalls get the eyes and no one else does. And also with, with this play, whilst I didn't take a naturalistic approach to presenting it, the language is completely naturalistic. So they can't break the fourth wall in that sense, because if they do, they can't sort of play it out, you know, play it out as if, as if the fourth wall isn't there, because then you lose the sense that we are in another world and we are in another world. We're in Kolkata, we're somewhere else, we're not in London. And, so therefore they have to find other ways of reaching the audience while staying true to the naturalistic text in a, on an expressionistic set. So, you know, it was tricky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it worked fantastically well. Um, you'd separated out different areas which became different rooms, yeah. but then there were times when the actors could use all of the set at one time. Yeah. Particularly um, what struck me we call it in GTSC drama proxemics, the distance oh, that you right. place between other characters um, and yourself and what that says about their relationship. And I wonder how much that was a factor in, you talked earlier about Nero being swept up by Tom and he sort of invaded her personal yes. space in yes. a big way. Whereas with a character like Das, she always had a huge amount of space between her and him. She did when she could. As a director, I do it all the time. I'm very interested in what I, what I call it, my own thing, is tension lines. So I work off um, an idea of tension lines. So the tension line between us at the moment is really neutral. But if I were to sort of do this, you would feel much less neutral. And if I were to go over there, you would feel different again. So for example, in the big love reconciliation scene between Das and Mrs. Lahiri, I placed them very far away from each other because the emotional tension between them makes it impossible for them to be close. So when they have their big romantic reconciliation scene, you might think that the instinct is to pull them close together. I went the complete opposite. And I, want, and I kept saying to them, play the tension across the stage, play it. You can't move closer to each other. The history of your relationship is pushing you apart. So you can't, you can't move. So it was an, that was my choice to do that. And, I think it was really powerful. So then when they did move together, you just felt that tension compress, 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 compress. Rather than saying, well, this is an intimate scene. 
from the beginning, which it was, so let's put them close together. So sometimes the interesting thing is to work against what's on the text and do something that actually looks on the page like the opposite of what's happening. Because you make the, you make the audience feel something themselves then. So I talk about that a lot, tension lines. How much is that impacted by the uh, culture of the, the setting, the context? Absolutely the everything, all the time. People are not, you know, touching each other in a casual way, you know, in Victorian India. You know, that although, again, I would say that Mrs. Lahiri and Nero absolutely did. So as soon as we have them on their own in the kitchen, they are physically close. They're touching each other. They're fiddling with each other's hair. They're, they're, they're very tactile. But in normal circumstances, no. So something that breaks that social construct, like, for example, when Nero, for her own reasons, gets Dr. Rank to put the bells on her ankle, that is a transgressive physical act. Even though, you know, really nothing happens apart from she puts his, her foot in his lap. The social construct of that era, the world that we're in, makes that moment incredibly transgressive. And you could feel it in the auditorium. People bought into that. It was great. You know, like, all she did, all she did really was put her foot on someone's lap. But actually, because we had built the world, we all knew that that was, <gasps> whoa, including him. So you have this really charged, erotic moment, which is because of the social construct rather than the act itself. What's fascinating when watching the play is the way that Nehru's psychological state is reflected through the design elements that we see and hear on the stage um, in quite an expressionist style. Mm -hmm. How did you work with the designers to uh, explore that? That was one of the great joys, actually. We had two people working on sound and music. We had Gregory Clark, who was sound designer, and Arun Ghosh, who was composer and performed live. So he was in the rehearsal room a lot, as was Gregory, and they worked very closely together. So sometimes we would have a sound world and sometimes we would have live underscore of scenes. So that particularly came through when you might remember the scene where she performs the katak for Tom and Dr. Rank as a rehearsal for the, the, the party. And having that music live and him being able to work with Anjana, Arun and Anjana being able to riff off each other. I mean, I, you know, we had, um, we had a choreographer come in, Shivani came in to choreograph. So it was this really um, collaborative uh, moment, but the music was utterly important all the way through the play. But there I think reached a particular peak, a particular climax and of her emotional state, because that's when she really is the pressure of dealing with the debt, the blackmail, Tom, Dr. Rank, all of this is all coming to a head. And so we were able to really manifest that orally and that, and as well as physically. And I thought that was just such a benefit to me. And I, and I loved being able to see the musician as well. Arun being physically present on the stage made the whole thing, again, as you said, not naturalism because he was there and, you know, we could see him, but it didn't seem to go against the naturalism of our understanding that, that we understood the characters to be real people. So there was kind of a few little juxtapositions of style that I played with in that production, which thankfully did come off, but um, the music being live was, really exciting and allowed, um, I mean, obviously the music was scored and we knew what he was going to play and Aaron knew what he was going to play, but sometimes the timing of a scene might change slightly due to, you know, the emotion of the night, the audience reaction, the fact it's maybe week three of the run and Aaron was able to respond to that. So he might slow something down. He might add a little sound that he hadn't played before. Joyful. Was your direction to, um, for the music to echo the atmosphere or Nero's sort of psychological state or a combination? Yeah, both. There was a kind of a strand of his composition that was to do with Nero's emotional and psychological journey. And there was also wrapped around that because he's brilliant, was a um, setting of place and world. So he did the two things at the same time. Very talented man. And then Gregory completely worked alongside him and, and, and supported and enhanced that. Wonderful. And particularly at the time that it was performed here in the theatre, um, I think the Me Too kind of side of things was just coming about. God, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And there was a, one of our, oh, there was a moment that I will stay with me forever, I think, as a director. And towards the end of the play, and I positioned it really far down stage left. When Tom has found out what she has done, 
um, which of course was all to protect him and their life. He kneels beside her, back to your proxemics question, and he says, I forgive you. And the first time I saw that in front of an audience, the whole auditorium, which was a lot of young people that night actually, and a lot of young women in the audience, just gasped, but didn't just go, <gasps> they went, whoa. It was a visceral reaction. And that's what I mean by contemporary lens. I didn't have to do anything. The reaction all sat in the auditorium, which is kind of, and the thinking sat in the auditorium, which is where, where I want the thinking to happen. But it was an extraordinary moment. The whole auditorium, just the sound just rattled through the auditorium of like, what? It was brilliant. And on that moment, you've placed him with his back to the audience, so it becomes... Yeah, he was kind of on an angle, yeah. And that sort of guides the audience in understanding whose story this is. Yeah, what was brilliant is they didn't wait for Nero's reaction, they had their own. With Nero leaving at the end, it's quite an understated yeah. moment. And as an audience member, you almost sort of feel that sense of, I want to go with her through that door. Great. <laughs> How did you go about developing that moment, which is pivotal to the play, really? It's huge. That was a real instinct I had from the get-go, which I discussed with Tanika before we even went into rehearsals, which is this: that the end of that play is described as the iconic door slam, right? And as soon as I hear that, I'm like, I don't want to do it. Because that just feels like the thing that everyone does. As soon as I hear iconic, I'm like, ugh. So there was a, an instinct in me to interrogate that moment and not just do the thing. Um, and then, really, it evolved very naturally in rehearsals with Anjana and myself, um, that, there, that she wouldn't slam the door because one, she is, she's not leaving in a tantrum. This is a very different lens than middle-class Norway. This is a woman who is risking even more to do what she's doing because she is a woman, she's an Indian woman, she's leaving a white man, she's, she's, so she leaves, she's, we, we wanted her, she sort of slips out rather than storms out. And there was lots of reasons for that. Um, it's not, and primarily that she's leaving, she's just going, she's not making a fuss. She's not making a thing of her exit. The work has been done in the scene before. So this is the technical side of it is, I felt directorially that after the, the sort of explosive nature of the scene that precedes the exit, to slam the door felt a bit histrionic. And that, also she's Indian, she's not white, middle-class Norwegian. And it felt more right to Angina that that's the way she, that she did it. And it just felt like, it's almost like she slips away, he turns, she's gone, too late. For me, that almost felt like a metaphor for, for Britain as well, like they make, British imperialism messes something up and then goes, oh no, and then it's too late, damage is done. So it kind of, it's, it's also a kind of a political point that Tom doesn't notice till it's too late, that it's, that it's irretrievable. And at the time, as we still are, we were talking about Brexit, we were talking about lots of political um, decisions, and it feels like that felt like a very colonial moment that you, that the power makes a terrible, terrible damage happen and doesn't notice until it's too late. So there was like, there was something really powerful actually about the way she exits, because it, it, she doesn't perform her exit, she just leaves. And the audience are left with Tom, which I guess. Yeah, yeah, we you, are. And we're like, now what are you gonna do? So, so that also felt like quite a political point. But I th also feel that we did try and make some sense of not just utter misery at the end, that we, we felt, Elliot and I, that all of that being said, that Tom had learned and, had, and we, we, we don't know what happens to Tom at the end of the, of the story, we don't know. But we felt that he was gonna try and rebuild himself and he would rebuild as something better and different. Mm -hmm.